check one, two. Yes, I am using my computer audio. Oh, I couldn't get warm today. Now I can't cool down. <laughs> I'm freaking out. Uh, K Green coming up as soon as we sort our issues. Actually, it's 11.01 now, so we're pretty much on time. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, man. It's brutal. I did have that same echo for another one of my interviews that I had on Zoom. Can't remember if I just gutted it out or what happened, how we solved the problem, but we're working on it. I'm just gonna communicate with Kay to give us another try on the same meeting link. Man, it's my computer slow. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> Jeez, my thing is just like molasses. Minus 14 like it is today. Wow, I've never seen my computer so slow. It's not always the way. We get a breakdown, she says. Coffee will make me sweat. What the piss is going on here? All right. Sorry for the technical difficulty. Sorry is a sorry way of being. Everything's landmark today. Ding dong. There you are. I think I had YouTube in the background playing or some something ridiculous. I can't hear you now. <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay. Perfect. Yep. All right. Are we ready? Let me adjust this angle so there's more of my head in there. Yes. What's going on, Kay Green? It's been a long time, and I forgot ever referring to you as coach. Where did <laughs> I don't know when that happened. Where did that come from? I have no idea, and I wonder if it was when you were running for the Green leadership. The is conversation that, is that when we, yeah, okay, is that when we had the most interaction together in 06? Uh, 06, yes. Um, I ran that year in that oh. election. That was the only time I ran. So, oh, oh okay. Um, but yeah, we did have a lot of interaction that year. <laughs> okay, so that was that was the first year as a Green candidate under the leadership of Elizabeth May. That was after her election, right? Or before? Oh, it was under Jim Harris. Yeah, yeah, that was his last. Oh, his last one. Because then so. I came back and ran in 08. Yes. Oh. Wow. Yep. What an idiot. <laughs> Okay, just for our listeners and uh, for anyone that's watching live, I'm going to put up a Zoom call later so they can see you right now. Okay. They're looking at me and hearing you. Ah, good. I'll, I'll put up I'm more video. comfortable with that. Oh, no, you'll be, you'll be up later. <laughs> 7 o'clock tonight, I'll have it up. I'll premiere tonight on YouTube at 7 o'clock so they can see your pretty face. Oh, thank and you. And I appreciate your time. Just uh, introduce yourself. Uh, you don't have to start at the beginning, but take as long as you need to kind of fully self-express your so I guess you don't. <laughs> I guess you don't need to say fully self-express. You, you just stop there. You don't have to say yourself after that. You're just self-expressed. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I am Kay Green, and um, it's funny. I'm probably going to talk right now, probably about the context we've known each other over the okay. years, because you know, any human being, there's so much. There's so much, but. Um, I was thinking about it, Jim, and actually, you're an omen to me. Omen, that means like... You are an omen. Like the devil? <laughs> no, that's a demon. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of the movie Omen. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wasn't Damien the omen? He was the devil, right? I don't know. I didn't watch that. I <laughs> didn't watch Probably that. But, but it's funny. Our paths have crossed so many times over the years, but it's like, for me... 
when the Jim Bannon crosses my path, wow. I know some huge shift is going to happen in my wow, life. Wow, really? So, yeah. So, so like well, when I saw- talk about me then. <laughs> <laughs> So when I saw your post the other day, I was actually excited. You know, this is what I was thinking. It's like, whoop, the Jim Bennett is Here crossing my path. So <laughs> I'm going to engage in this conversation. Cool. I'm and um, yeah, the first time was you were actually at the bar the same night I met my ex-husband and my life radically altered after that. So far. And uh, then the next time was, it was before the 06, and it was in the context of politics. It was at some green event uh, down in Port Dalhousie. I know I'd been already nominated by, you know, as the candidate for the Niagara Falls riding at that point, but, you know, running in that election, and that, that was really the jumping off point for me for a lot of the things that I did in community in Niagara. And I loved that period of my life. So right now I'm, you know, 46 and, you know, we, I was talking to you about, you know, midlife has really been different than I expected. And, uh, you know, if you asked me where I was going to be at 46, you know, when I turned 40, this is not where I thought I was going to be. You know, I figured midlife was going to be this gradual progression of the way things were it was going to be you know i'm wise now you know it's going to be easy but in those six years you know since i turned to 40 uh left fort erie sold our house uh, my family and i traveled for two years around the world visited 28 countries on five different continents um and at the end of it um my ex-husband and i decided you know it's time for us to part ways and so I ended up landing in London Ontario which is where I am now and um, it's been a whole new life I do not recognize life right now you know compared to what it was at 40 and I think I used the phrase you know it's been kicking my ass this is not a bad thing I respect those people who are willing to kick my ass and life has been kicking my ass. I'm not sure where I'm supposed to fully end up at this point. I'm still in the middle of it, but I think that's a lot of what midlife is. So, so I don't know if that's given the context of who I am, but no, no. No, I appreciate that. And feel free, feel free to, again, fully self-express. <laughs> I don't know how Just I keep going be, down that end. Be self-expressed. How's that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, because, um, and I appreciate your thoughts, and I, I want to know more about that as well. And let me just tell you a little bit about how this is coming full circle for me. So Beautiful. Um, I have been recently very frustrated by my lack, or sorry, by my political shift. Mm. I don't believe what I believed when I was 24 years old. Mm -hmm. I'm not a left wing ideologically possessed. I'm not that guy anymore. Yeah. I'm not the robot that went out and marched out. And I don't want to get into a debate on this, but yeah. uh, uh, choice, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I had like, I, I stood as a green candidate and said that women's right to choose was something I was in favor of because I was representing a party. Mm -hmm. But when I started, I was 24 years old, not realizing that until 50 or so, I had never really had an in-depth debate or discussion about it, about uh -huh. all the ramifications of it. And I, I ended up realizing I, I'm not cool with it. I'm not mm. cool with it, especially late term abortion now. And then it, it, it took a shift. Free speech for me is a huge thing. When Gillette did their ad, I was triggered, uh, angry, not threatened, but yes, I felt masculinity had been attacked and I'm tired of it and I won't stand for it. And I always have been that guy that won't stand for it. Yeah. And so I'm in a new place too. Mm -hmm. And then I listen to Tim Pool quite often. I like Tim because he's a natural lefty, like I still am. Mm -hmm. Except I, the left kind of left me is how I say it. Like Dave Rubin says, I didn't leave the left, the left left me. Because they just become too ideological, too far left. Mm -hmm. like, we don't need 75 bathrooms. And again, I don't want to dissect all these, you know, the transgender, you know, all this kind of stuff. That's not my point here. Mm -hmm. But when I was listening to Tim Pool the other day, he's got a new uh, channel, IRL. And the censorship has been just baffling. And it only seems to be very politically motivated. So the right 
conservatives are the ones getting banned, it seems like. Mm -hmm. The Alex Joneses and the, you know, they tried to get Steven Crowder off the air and uh, uh, Gavin McInnes, which I think is just the sweetest, most funny guy. Yeah, he still talks like we used to on the playground. Mm -hmm. I don't mean in high school. I mean in elementary school when a racist slur meant nothing. And and everyone got them and everything was your mother was on the table everything was no one was ever offended or hurt or went home oh maybe we got our feelings hurt yeah we all did mm -hmm. so i was watching tim pool the other day which I, I really appreciate because he's a lefty but he's objective enough to call out the left and mm -hmm. he's disillusioned with it as well as far as like these people are crazy I mean, I care for everyone. How are you going to pay for that in the States? It's a huge question, right? Yeah. So, although I am still a lefty, I still believe in, you know, tax pollution, uh, you know, carbon fee and dividend, not the carbon tax. And so as it relates to politics, but the other issues, free speech, don't mess with my guns, censorship, this, the 75 genders issue, uh, like mm -hmm. just disregarding basic biological or science. It, it's had a hard time. I mean, anyways, I was mm. watching Tim Pool the other day. And they had on a guy named Jack Murphy. Well, Jack Murphy, and this is so cool because I just two days ago was introduced to Jack Murphy, mm -hmm. probably two days after I booked a call with you and you said, hey, midlife's kicking my ass. And I'm like, well, <laughs> I don't consider myself midlifing right now. Yep. One, because I don't have the family and the wife and the kids and all that. I still, strangely enough, kind of see myself getting there. I'm yes. Still, I could still have a kid, you know? Yes. And I want and desperately to you. have a woman and a partner in my life yeah. that I trust and that we can build a future together and stuff like that. So it's not yeah. out of the question. I've just been jerking around and wasting time with, mm -hmm. with whatever, learning my lessons maybe. <laughs> so Jack Murphy <laughs> is on with uh, Tim Pool, and they start talking about the liminal order. Well, okay. I don't even, I'm not even familiar with what liminal means, mm -hmm. okay? So I looked it up, and it, it, from all I can tell, it means, in his context, um, a transition. Mm. And what he's made, so he was, his, his marriage broke down. Yeah. Then he found that life had completely changed. Dating had changed. Yep. Women had changed. The way you mm -hmm. approach women had changed. Men had yep. changed. Life had changed since he was, you know, in this box of marriage, and he didn't have to worry about it. Mm. Then he's a Trump supporter. Mm -hmm. So his ideological uh, bent as far as conservatism in the States got him doxxed. Uh. They publicly put his email and his address. They sent letters to the little league that he coached in. His kids mm -hmm. were tormented at school. And now he said, like, I'm in, I don't, I have to learn it all over again. And yeah. I kind of, I'm like, hey, this is so cool. Uh, he has a, he has this group called the Liminal Order, and it's it, it, only a men's group, right? Yeah. And it, 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 from what I can see, so I haven't been invited to it, and I'm not sure that I ever will. Yeah. Uh, I think they screen their candidates that they invite into this, and, and from what I can tell, it's a group of guys that are going to support each other and help each other to be better, so they can go out into the world and make a powerful difference to make the world better for everyone. The idea is masculinity has taken a massive shot and that leadership and that eldership for both boys and girls is really important. Mm -hmm. You know, in the States, 85% of the black community are fatherlessness. And mm -hmm. I think it's the number one issue facing us that maybe, well, the number one issue for me is don't try and tell me what I can say and what I can't say. Don't okay. put me in jail for making a racist, even if I call hate on someone or I say fire in a crowded, like it, it no, you let me say whatever I like. I'm an absolutist almost when it comes to it because now, now we see I'm blathering a little bit. But Ezra Levant of Rebel News now is being stopped from asking protesters questions because the cops say it could be an incitement to violence. So we're going to prevent you from committing a criminal act. What? Like I'm crazy pulling my hair out. So this liminal order, it, it comes back to here's a guy that had to learn it all over again. And so when right. he said midlife is kicking my ass, I went, oh, this is, this is crazy spooky. So <laughs> I'm really looking forward to this conversation because I've been disconnected from Landmark mm -hmm. for 10 years. I didn't know that, yeah. but I took it into 03. Okay. And then with my girlfriend at the time, I thought, 
what a great experience this would be. So we went and got a hotel together and it was a nightmare. <laughs> it was just a, all the way through. And I was so hopeful. And you know, I only know two people that have ever taken the landmark form that got absolutely nothing out of it. Right. He was one of them. Okay. Anybody else that I've ever experienced had this transformational shift of uh, epic proportions. Yeah. And so I have been in contact with Landmark. I'm excited yeah. to go back with you on the 18th. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Even, the, even the, the ability to ride up with you is, is really great. And I'm looking into doing another CSL or CLS course leader support for them at some point when I can figure out you know, what exactly I'm doing. Cause I'm just not banging houses like I used to, yeah. you know, and yeah. uh, it's been too long for me as far as income, you know, lack of income or, or sporadic income or whatever. And uh, uh, you know, it's, it's time to, it's time to shift it. So it, yeah. it's strange how it all comes around and um, maybe I'm not as good at noticing or recognizing omens, but maybe you're one for <laughs> me too, because <laughs> who knows? Uh, I don't know who came up or what possessed me to say, finish this statement. And there's not many people that probably understand it or could finish it. But the possibility that I've invented for myself and my life is the possibility of inspiring, powerful leadership. If you look, ah. at, if you look at my social media, yep. you'll have to go back years to find anything that's, that has a scent of inspiring, powerful leadership. <laughs> Got it. I'm got it very angry on social media i always got tell it. people listen i'm not it's not me on social mm -hmm. media yeah i yeah. run the account but it's not a human being mm -hmm. you know to me it's a comedian and mm -hmm. it's an angry freaking comedian yeah too. so so yeah. it's strange how it so uh, how it all comes together but i'm looking forward to going up on the 18th with you and mm -hmm. then, and then digging into some of the results and some of the breakthroughs that you've been getting yeah in that context so yeah maybe you could just lead into a little bit of uh about where you are with that right now sure absolutely well the first time you know for me that i participated in the landmark forum was almost 20 years ago it was june in june of 2000 and um you know you'll always remember that person who introduced you to it and for me it was julie and she and i worked together uh, downtown Toronto at the time, and she was a difficult person to work with. I mean, like half my day was spent kind of managing, managing what Julie had done. Okay, you know? so who's Julie to you? Julie is, uh, she was a co-worker, but seriously, she, she was an unbelievable stand for me doing this work. You know, she went away, she did the work, and uh, like it it's it's a weekend it's a weekend you know friday she or end of the week she left monday morning she came back and she was this amazing person to work with that inspired all of us and it took me for a while it took me a while you know uh before i agreed to going but she was this consistent sand that i do this work and to her i am so grateful Amen. for the difference you know that it made in my life uh because at that time you know there had been all this stuff you know, my dad had died, my uncle had died, um, I was engaged, and you know, that fell apart. It was like all of the men that were important to me in my life were gone. And the only thing that was working for me at that point was my career. So of course I go in, you know, oh, I'm gonna have a breakthrough in my career, you know, and ultimately I did, but it was all this other stuff that I saw. And I was not at that time, you know, front row, engaged in things kind of person. I was back of the room, not participating. It's like, oh yeah, maybe it'll make a difference. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm there, you know, th not doing the work even fully. And at the forum, at the, forum the oh, first you weren't time. Fully participating in the forum. Oh no, I was sitting there. And then all of a sudden on the Saturday night, there was this exercise. <laughs> fear. Oh. Fear. And I was sitting there and I was present to it. I was just and the forum leader said something about, you know, there was a time when you felt this and you said, I will never feel this again. And the moment, the moment you said that, a part of you died and it just hit me. And then it was like all of a sudden, boom, 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 boom. You know, I found myself in my car 
driving back to Niagara to find this guy that, you know, had broken up with me because I was so scared of feeling hurt, you know, by the men, you know, that I'd left and I'd lost. I was so present to that and, you know, couldn't find him. But I was unstoppable, you know, that night. Like, it's like two o'clock in the morning. I'm at his parents' house, you know, phoning his parents, you know, trying to find out where he is. Like, this is not BK Green that that existed, you know, before I walked in that door. Couldn't find him, left a note in his mailbox. And, you know, by the time I got back to my apartment in Toronto, my phone was ringing. And, you know, that's the guy I married. That's the guy that I had two beautiful children with, you know, traveled the world with. My life radically altered because I was willing, you know, to really, really recognize just how much I was shutting off by being afraid, being afraid of being hurt. So that was, that was round one. And, you know, I participated for many years, um, lots of courses and the seminars I love because, you know, you go over 10 weeks and you're working on different distinctions and it becomes the context for your life, you know? Um, and I have these, like, I remember getting pregnant, you know, during, during a seminar, running for office, you know, during another seminar, community projects. These are the things that I brought to the seminar and I worked on in my life, you know, and it was like building muscles all the time. But this last time, you know, I ended up in London, as I said, you know, with, after we finished traveling. And for me, it was kind of a time of exploration, but I was kind of floating around, you know, and, and I didn't leave my marriage because I wanted someone else. That was not it, you know, but I met somebody else and, you know, we met and um, it was one of those things. We had coffee early afternoon. We ended up going out for drinks that night. And by the end of one week, I think we'd seen each other like 10 times. Mm -hmm. And so he was just, I started to see something being possible with this person. And, you know, when you start seeing something possible, what shows up? It's like, oh my gosh, all this stuff that's in the way. And I became really aware there's a lot I've got to complete, you know, powerfully with my marriage now that it's ended so that both, you know, my ex-husband and I can move forward. And for me, the quickest way that I know to get complete on something, to see what I can't see, see what's in my blind spots is to participate in the landmark forum. So without even thinking about it, really, I'm like, yeah. I'm going to do this. So I did it again in November and with the commitment to really powerfully completing, you know, my marriage. And that's what we did. You know, the Sunday night of the forum, you know, my ex-husband is there, my daughter's there and the conversations we had throughout that weekend about, you know, who we were to each other, who we were going to be for each other in the future. We had those conversations and it was a stepping away with freedom, a stepping away with power and a stepping away, really being present to, to what we had done to get how beautiful all of it had been and, you know, what was going to be possible for both of us in the future. So that's what started me on this journey again. But it's funny, you know, because, you know, I've been doing this work for years and you have to confront. I started a seminar after that and it's like, whoa, you know, we can be really arrogant about, you know, what we've done in the past and kind of sit on that. So it's really shaken me up and looking at, you know, what do I want to create now? You know, what do I want that future to be like? And, you know, I kind of downplay some of the stuff that I've looked at, but uh, I actually started taking piano lessons again. I, <laughs> I stopped playing piano when I was 20 and I was quite accomplished at that point, but I'd had a, I'd had a biking accident, which resulted in a head injury and I couldn't. I just couldn't connect with the music anymore and I hated playing. So I stopped and like I was, you know, it was grade eight RCM. I was accomplished at that point and just gave it up. And, you know, when I, as I've been exploring, it's funny because I've done all these amazing things. Like my bucket list did not have anything on it other than, you know, being a rock star. And it was funny. I'd had this conversation, you know, with one of, uh, one of my teammates and he was talking about, you know, yeah, I've always wanted to be a rock star. And it's like, you know, let's give this a shot. Not that, you know, a rock star is the thing, but it's a place to start, you know? 
and it was confronting, but the perfect teacher appeared, you know, here in London. It's so funny. You know, I came to the city because I wanted to be anonymous and I started volunteering at the Grand and the person who interviewed me there, she was actually the flower girl at my parents' wedding and the perfect teacher, perfect piano teacher for me. So I've been working with her and, you know, there's so much from just that that I've been getting, you know, about the discipline of daily doing the work, you know, and confronting, you know, those, those things you're scared to do. Like I'm terrified of performing, you know, I just, I see myself where I was and I know I'm not there, you know, but what's missing? It's doing the work. And that's a lot of what Landmark is about too. You know, we, a lot of times, you know, we're afraid to do the work or we're not willing to do the work and doing the work makes a difference. Okay, so just quickly, if I if I leave the screen here, just keep yeah. talking because I'm not. I'm just checking. But uh, <laughs> tell me just quickly what was the fear exercise, and then expand on the work a little bit. The work, the fear exercise. Is that the one when you stand and you stare into someone's eyes? Oh Google? no, no! Oh. I think that's in the advanced course that you do that one. Uh, but the the nice. fear exercise in the forum, you're sitting in the room, and You've got your eyes closed and oh it's coming back yeah the the forum leader is is really he's saying a whole bunch he or she is saying a whole bunch of things to get you present to what coaching you into getting to a place where you're afraid of yes the person on either side of you is really where where they're trying to get you to and really getting present to how 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 what that experience is like and really that that is our experience we're afraid of that person on our left we're afraid of that person on our right and yeah it takes a bit and it's dark and it's quiet and it's icky feeling you know and i shouldn't give it away but kind of the joke at the end is you realize that that person on your right and that person on your left they're just as afraid of you as you are of them and so much of that landmark those distinctions yes crashing on you yes like yeah. a, like you were standing still on the beach and a wave just completely like yeah it, there's no way to get out from underneath that type of right thing. right that, that aha moment or when you pop as they say in yeah the yeah <laughs> and, and then, it's go ahead the work yes the work well like as i said my first experience of doing the forum I did not do the work, you know, the first two days. I expected it to happen to me. And, you know, that's kind of a default thing, you know, for a lot of us. We think, oh, yeah, we're going to sit there and, you know, magically. And sometimes that does happen. Mm -hmm. But, you know, most of the time when things actually happen in our lives, it's because we show up. We go. We do the work. And, and we do the work with a commitment, you know. I, this is what I want, you know, this is what I'm standing for. And then we act aligned with it. We do what's required. That's, that's, you know, how we make the difference. But, you know, through the forum, a lot of the work is actually having conversations. You know, we, you know, how during the breaks, you have to get on the phone and have those calls, you know, with your parents, with the people that you're incomplete with, you know, those sorts of things. And a lot of that work, you know, in the context of Landmark is having conversations. It's having con enrollment conversations is what they're called. And I know you know, mm -hmm. I love because you, you use those words all the time, but enrollment is causing a possibility to be present for another such that they are touched, moved, and inspired. And those are the conversations that make a difference, you know. Like you talked before about your possibility of inspiring, powerful leadership. And there was a time in your life where that really lit you up. That's what drove everything. That was, that was who you were in the world and you got up in the morning and who am I going to be? I am inspiring powerful leadership and everything that you did was within that, you know, powerful leadership was a huge possibility for me for years. And you know, that, that is what caused me to be who I was in community caused me, you know, to be who I was in my family in politics in my works. And it's not my default. You know, my default is small under the radar anonymous you know stay in bed you know curl up and read don't engage with the world
but you know, with that possibility out there of powerful leadership, it gives me different, different ways of being. And you know, now I'm playing with the possibility of power, fun, and connection. And there's so much that's become available for me. Like I can make stuff really serious and significant, and I can be really scary, <laughs> really scary <laughs> when I do that. So, you know, having that possibility of fun, uh, it gives me new ways of being that that I haven't had available before, you know, and how I interact with my daughter. My daughter's a teenager and she's amazing. Like, you know, I have just been gifted with these great kids, but they challenge me. But she and I, we have so much fun, you know, when we banter back and forth. And uh, she refers to me as sometimes as the most inappropriate mother ever. And sometimes I am, but you know, <laughs> but I can be with that, you know, in the context of power, fun and connection, you know. So yeah, all those conversations led me back to my act, which I can't, ah, I, I'm always okay. present to my possibility and you're right. It's been a long time since I've been connected to it. And it's been a long time since I focused on that as a way of being honoring my word and being that right. all the time for everyone else and myself. And then my act, ah. you, know, you know how long it took me to get my possibility months ah. now, when I watched the, um, uh, City Slickers with Billy Crystal. There's okay. a scene where Billy Crystal says, hey, what was the best, the best memory of your life? Well, you can quote my marriage. You can quote the day my children were born. You can say, I remember, hey, and I was stumped because I don't have those things in my life. Mm. I, you know, I, I don't remember the first time I drove. I don't remember the first time I went to a bar. I don't remember um, anything significant that you know, normal people would say, hey, that was a great day in my life. You know, I turned mm -hmm. 21, my kid was born, I got married, the, my wife walking down the aisle, I don't know. I, I, and I was for months in this mm -hmm. question mm -hmm. and then completely depressed by the fact that I had to search for so long because I had a list of nightmares that I could give you. Yeah. The worst days of my life were not difficult to pinpoint. Mm -hmm. So then I, I kept coming back to what's wrong with me? Mm. Like, who am I? Who have I become? Or all, have all the choices that I've laid and made in my life led me to a point of what? Nothing. Mm -hmm. So then when they asked me to, you know, whole and complete comes, you know, I think everyone gets that one first. Oh, I want to be whole. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. boring you know and you saw yeah. uh one of my friends that was in the thread the other day and i'm just me I, I i thought about saying it and i'm like yeah i'm gonna say it because i i, I like saying stuff i'm like oh geez that's boring <laughs> what a boring possibility it felt bad but he's like hey that's who i am right it was uh layton and he plays piano as well uh paul layton and um then it was the same thing about my possibility. I couldn't come up with something that fired me up. Yeah. And then it's, it's weird because you know, you remember where you were when the, when the planes hit the tower. Well, right. I, I remember that too, but I also remember where I was when the lightning bolt of my inspiring powerful leadership came to me. Okay. I was sitting on Welland Avenue facing the QEW about to go under the, at that, that light at the service road, going yep. under, the, under the highway, under the yep. overpass. And it hit me again, like a wave or like a, like a bolt of lightning. I was like, wow, I got it. I popped <laughs> right there. And uh, for a long time, I lived in that. And for yep. a long time now I've, I've given it up. My, I think mm. I've let my act take over. And I had no problem, I don't think, describing my act. My Tell act me about is, that. Yeah, uh, I, I'm pretty sure my act is, um, it doesn't matter and I don't care. Ah, got it. it. It's such a lie because everything matters. And I, yep. because I know that, yep. you know, I'm not, I have some friends that don't read the paper, couldn't tell you who, AOC is like if I ever meet a girl and they say well what do you do for fun and I say well I troll AOC and they say hey, who's AOC I'm like check because <laughs> <laughs> you want somebody like for me I want somebody that's like I realized now at this age of my life uh, I'm Christian and I think mm -hmm. that the 
that dating someone that doesn't believe is a waste of my time. Got it. Okay. Got it. I want yep. somebody that at least has the faith as a common foundation. Got it. And so um, the lie that I created that gets me off everything mm -hmm. is it doesn't matter and I don't yeah. care. And yeah. I ran up against it last night at seven o'clock. I've been, I've been committed to going live on YouTube. I had this growth on the YouTube channel uh, for whatever reason. I've been working. It's a 10-year-old YouTube channel. Uh, I worked from, you know, in the last two years, I worked from 50 subs to 200 subs. And that was an mm -hmm. accomplishment for me. Mm -hmm. And I never thought I'd get monetized. And then mm -hmm. okay, it happened overnight. Oh my goodness. I'm at 1.5 million views total. Now I have one video that just broke 500,000 views. I monetized mm -hmm. I'm probably 4,300 subs. I've cashed two very small checks from Google. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping, hopefully like next month is where I had all my action. I, I, I'm expecting a half decently sized check uh, this month. I never thought it would happen. And it, it all, it like, so last night, so when I, once I got monetized, I said, once I get monetized, I'm going to go live at seven o'clock. Got it. On YouTube. Mm -hmm. The Facebook live, everyone can do it. And I, you know, there's, I actually feel like too many people think they know me on Facebook. Mm, okay. So my, my vulnerability out there is much greater than it is on Twitter, where I have double the followers, but I feel like no one knows me. Mm -hmm. And if you say to me, oh, Jimmy, I thought I knew you, <laughs> no, I'm still attached to the meaning that I, I uh, insert into your comment. Right. It's because we okay. shared an experience because uh, you know, I like you, I want you to like me. And if you ever say, well, yeah, I made a, you know, a video called Fuck Gillette because I was really pissed off at the way yeah. they were trashing masculinity. And I had so many of the people that I know and love, maybe not as well as they think they know me, come or say to me on Twitter or publicly comment in the link going, geez, I really thought I knew you. What mm. has become of you? And that mm. hurts. So now when I go yeah. live, I don't go live on Facebook because I'm a little, I haven't reached the point where I don't like, where I can just say, forget about it. Because if you say, forget about it to the haters, you also have to say, I forget about it to the ones that give you props and praise and love. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you're not going to care, you can't care about either one of them. Right. Right. You know? And so I realized that, and I ran up against this last night. Who really cares if I skip a night? Like really, I, I don't feel like it today. Yeah. I don't feel like I have, I'm not wound up passionately. I'm not ready to go. Yep. And I'm going to suck. And you know what? No one really cares. So it's just easier for me to take a nap or do, <laughs> do whatever it is yep. and not have any cameras rolling. Yeah. And I actually looked for inspiration. I called a few of my peeps and I was like, you know, sometimes somebody can say something and it just puts it in my head. And I'm like, oh, that's two hours of content now because my fear is I'm going to turn the camera on. I'm going to have nothing to say. Ah, if, I okay. have a, if I have an interview, then that's no problem because I can talk yeah. and, 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 and ideas come. But the lie that I had created for myself and my act was it doesn't matter and I don't care. And I was stuck there last night. Got it. And then Got I went it. anyways. And it was maybe one of the worst shows I've ever done, but I did it. Yes. And, and maybe Shut I look up. back at it you later the work. and I go, wow, it wasn't <laughs> that bad. And, uh, you know, I've been talking about this conversation for a couple of days on every time I do go live because it, it's, it, it's important to me. So mm -hmm. I appreciate the time and you coming back. I, I don't know why I put that out there. There was a, a trigger of some sort and, and I was so grateful because many of my lefty friends uh, which I would put you in that category, who honestly don't recognize me anymore, or yeah. think I've changed in a way that they they can't understand. And and if I say, well, at least Trump's really got on that Im illegal immigration; it's down seventy five percent over the last mm -hmm. year. They're like, well, you're racist. No, I'm not. I just don't want people crossing illegally into my country, or even the one next to me. Yeah. Like you can't even give the guy props on a certain thing that he's done successfully without this. And I really, I'm so grateful for Trump because I think he's brought this conversation to us. You know, what he said on the bus, you know, what he said about Mexicans coming across the border. You know, there, there was cages 
under Obama. Mm -hmm. You know, there was kids in cages mm -hmm. under Obama. And for what I, we weren't talking about immigration then. No. Because no. Trump comes in and he wants to build this wall and it's controversial. And there's lots of people that, that push back against it. Now we're talking about the immigrants and, you know, sanctuary cities and all this kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. I see him as a blessing. And all I did yeah. when he came in, all I did was say, I am not going to one waste any of my hate where it's placed right now. Mm -hmm. Cause I know I've tried to get rid of it. It just, I'm human, right? I, yeah. I acknowledge that there's going to be a certain level of hate that exists all the time for me. Yeah. But I can move it around mm -hmm. and I can increase it. Mm. Uh, I'm trying to dilute it and, and repress it or push it down or eliminate it if I could. And all the, all, the only deal I made for Trump when before he was, uh, I didn't think he would make it to inauguration. I thought someone would take him out. That's crazy. But uh, here he is. I just said, I'm not going to hate. I'm not going to waste my hate on him. I'm not going to mm. generate any new hate. And I'm not going to, because I experienced that with Stephen Harper. Okay. I couldn't look at him with going, <clears throat> There were so many things. Mm, yeah. And maybe hate's a strong word. My mother always used to say that. So, uh, and now I can look at Trump objectively. Got it. And I can look at him and say, well, I find him funny. Mm, <laughs> I yeah. A lot of people that don't. Uh, so that's, that's a little bit of a boat, boat where my shift has come up, but yeah. this idea that um, my act is, it doesn't matter. And I don't yeah. care. Yeah. It gets me off a of responsibility of almost yes. anything I need to be released from. Yep. And that's powerful. Mm. Powerful to be able to see that because when you could see it, then you know it's there. Like it's not longer in your blind spot. You can actually do something about it. And you know, it's, it, you know, you're talking about something that I'm really present to in what you've just said, Jim, is about how as human beings, we're shying away from our, di from difficult conversations you know, because people don't agree with us. And um, we don't want to hear what they have to say. And, you know, in particular, you brought up what was going on down at that, at the Mexican border with the separation of families. For me, that was a very, very personal thing. I actually, while I was traveling, I did a contract with UNHCR on just that immigration detention and alternatives to detention. Yep. And when everything blew up down there, when this all came into the media, I was actually crossing that border with my family. And I was so present to, whoa, I've got the right passport. You know, my kids look the right way. My experience is so different, you know, from these other kids. And it broke my heart, you know, knowing that these kids are being separated. And you're right. This has been going on forever and it's not something we've been talking about. And no, none of this is pleasant, you know, and there's stuff going on all over the world that, you know, doesn't work. You know, it doesn't work for those kids, you know, it's, and you and I are going to see this completely differently, but both of us have to be engaged in that conversation if we're actually going to create a world that works. People who view things differently are going to have to be able to sit down and not see each other because they view things differently as, as you know, the enemy, but really as a partner and making something, something that works. So, and we're not good at that. We are not good at that as human beings. We'd rather see things the way we want to see them and not listen. But so, you know, you're talking about fatherless kids you know, fathers being present, I think it's these conversations missing that are really what's breaking it down. We aren't engaging in these conversations. We're scared of people. We're, you know, we hate people. Hate is there in a lot of our conversations. And that's what's so. frustrating for me because I see mm. the Trump in me. I see mm. and accept that that is part of my nature to be like Trump is. Okay. Mm. And so, and I, I see also the ignorance of a Madonna at a woman's march standing at the lectern and saying, you know, I think about bombing the white house every day mm. and she doesn't get, she's pulling a Trump. Mm. Like when I'm pulling a Trump, I get it. And ah, sometimes okay. it's in an act and a performance or a bit, you know, I've been doing yeah. bits where I've been working on cause I realized some of these bits, some of these stories are t they're, they're little comedy bits. They can make mm -hmm. someone laugh. And what's yeah. more important? Mm -hmm. and great segue. I'm glad you led me down.
this path. I wonder, and you don't have to have all the answers right now, but mm -hmm. for the thinkers, I like to ask this question. What do you think the top three conversations are that we're not having or having badly that need to actually happen to move us forward? And I set this discussion with the ground rules of we're more tolerant, we're more accepting, we're more pro uh, progressive, we're healthier, we have more information, we're richer. There's no one starving in the world right now unless it's under uh, a political oppression. We've never been in a better place. Yeah. But it can always be better. And we've got some serious, serious issues. Right. Want to give you opioid uh, uh, problem. Yeah. About the mentorship or the eldership that's lost with our with our youth, both men and women. But I think men are feeling it more because men were taken out of the family first. They okay. were the industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, welfare recipients couldn't have a man in the house. And now 85% of the black families in the States are fatherless. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a huge, so I've got my top three, the three, I think free speech for me is number one. We have yep. to have a conversation around censorship. And then number two, I think is for me has got to be fatherlessness. And then I think there's a religious conversation we need to have. Can we be sure that Christians, Jews and Arabs, or I shouldn't say Arabs, Muslims can coexist? Mm. Can we can, can we come to an agreement where okay, uh, the Quran might say some crazy stuff, but we're not fearful of being pushed into the ocean and eliminated? Like mm. we need to have a conversation where we can. And yeah, we've got all kinds of capital punishment, abortion. There's all kinds of issues that we can that we can talk about. But there's a, a, a bunch of conversations that we're having badly or not having at all that we yeah. really need to have fleshed out. Not when people are going to go no you're a bigot and just turn you yeah. on. You need, and I think the left has been not so great at doing that. Mm -hmm. you know, I find that the left is kind of in a, in a, they're in an echo chamber a little bit. They listen okay. to CNN and they don't ever watch Fox news. Well, mm -hmm. I watch CNN all, not all the time, but I also watch, like, I have a balance mm -hmm. and they don't make up my mind for me, but at least I'm yeah. balanced. I want to yeah. know what the other arguments are. So that if I'm having an educated discussion, I can take those arguments apart. Mm. But I find that the, the left doesn't seem to always want to, and I, I'm generalizing, obviously, they're not as open to having those discussions and want to shut it down by saying you can't say that or we can't talk about that. So mm. what do you think some of the really important discussions are that we're not having or having badly? Well, <laughs> and my conversations are probably going to come, come at things from a slightly different angle. What I'm hearing a lot and what you were just talking about, Jim, are those us and them conversations that we have, you know, whether we make it about the right or the left. And I actually find it kind of funny that you considered me on the left. I was definitely there in my teens. Yeah. Oh, and, you know, you know, there's that church, I call it the Churchill flip, but it's something like if you're, if you're not a socialist or if, how does it go? No, when, when you're young, if you don't vote, you got to vote with your heart, which is left. Yeah. When you're grown up, when you're older, you vote with your head, which yep. is right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, you know, and I remember hitting in my 30s, you know, having this realization that one or the other was not going to work. You know, I needed to go down a path where I had both heart and brain, you know, working. And um, so we need them both, you know. Definitely. We need them both, but I definitely came from the right, you know. Um, there was a lot of blue in my green, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. But but it's like, why? What has us having these us and them conversations all the time? So that's one of my one of the conversations I think we should have. For me, as a parent, and you know, becoming a parent shifted my worldview much more than I ever expected it would. So it's like, what, what kind of world do we want to leave for our kids? You know, what do we need to be doing now? You know, to, and what does that world look like? We need to have some creation conversations about really what we all are committed to or not committed to leaving. And I think the other one is, you know, you brought up, everything's here. You know, everything is available to us. Why aren't we thriving? Why aren't we thriving, you know, in this space? So, 
my conversations are probably a little different. You know, they're not so much issue based, but really what's going on underneath? What is going on underneath and what, where is it we want to go? Those are the conversations I think that will make a difference, you know, for all, all of those other things. Yeah, do you sense a, 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 I believe, well, I'm sensing a lack of gratitude on both sides, but again, mm -hmm. I'm more focused on the left because they irritate me a little bit more. <laughs> you know, yes. The idea that, like, we don't live in a rape culture, okay? Mm -hmm. Women and minorities are not oppressed. They're not, yes, does discrimination happen? Absolutely. Does rape, absolutely. Rape, that's horrible. But we don't live in a culture. You want to go to a rape culture? I can point to a couple of countries where you can go mm -hmm. and see where women are actually oppressed. Mm -hmm. So in the freest countries on earth, in North America, we have these ideologically possessed far, well, let's call them radicals on both sides, but I don't see them on the right so much. Like you don't see KKK and white supremacists complaining that there's too many black people around. Like, did, did, I think you could fit the KKK in your standard Starbucks and you'd still have capacity for more people. Mm. Like it just does. But on the left, this idea, yes, um, there's too many homeless. There's too mm. many drug addicts. There's too, way too much mental illness. Mm -hmm. But look around you, man. Mm -hmm. These are the greatest times we've ever known. Mm -hmm. And I think, and Jordan Peterson brought me to this conclusion. You know, you think you're going to make little tweaks to the system. Mm -hmm. But it's far easier to make a tweak that ruins the system than it is. Like if you've if you got a system that's operating at 80% uh, efficiency, let's say. Okay. To bring it to 82 or 84 or 85 without collapsing it is difficult. Mm -hmm. And it's far easier to tinker with something that's working pretty well and have it fail and backfire on you. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, yeah. that's. And these people think they're going to kick out the foundations of Western civilization, mm -hmm. traditions like mother and father of different sexes in a, a nuclear fam. Uh, is that what nu Nuclear fam Yeah, yeah like a traditional family, you're going to mm -hmm. kill God and you think everything's going to be fine. And then you take father out and you put him in the workplace. You take mother out. Now you put her in the workplace. I don't think we've seen the full effect of what mom going to work has done to our kids. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, like, where's the gratitude? Mm -hmm. Like, why can't you step outside in New York City and look at it, these skyscrapers and go, it's a freaking miracle. I can mm -hmm. flip a switch and lights come on. Mm -hmm. I touch a dial and my furnace kicks in. Everything's mm -hmm. interconnected. Mm -hmm. We've lifted, we've lifted, we're almost eliminating poverty in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, like the UN had a, a 2015 deadline. Mm -hmm. They beat it by three years. Mm -hmm. we're, you know, we're connecting people to the grid. We're fresh water, poverty. And what's done it? Capitalism. And these guys are going around telling us we need more socialism. I just don't get it. So mm. uh, do you sense a lack of gratitude on both sides of people that just don't see the progress we've made? And, and Gary Vee or whoever it is asks this question, who is better off, you or your grandparents? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Case made. What are you freaking complaining about? There's no mm -hmm. Black Plague. There's no World War II. There's not, like, you don't have any problems mm -hmm. except where, you know, where you can get your next version of Jordan Air Nikes. Mm -hmm. It makes me think of King Lear. Oh, reason not the need. You know, our basis beggar is in the poorest thing superfluous. You know, that there's always more than we need. Mm. And, um, but sometimes it is, it's not easy to get present to that, you know, and when you're suffering, when you are suffering and, People suffer in different ways. And I am not going to say it's not my place. Well, I do not feel it is my place if someone is suffering to say you should not be suffering. You know, I can't always see whatever that, that thing is um, that's hurting them. And I think it's my job to listen, you know, to that suffering and be with it. So, because um, that is their experience. And um, 
you know, I don't know what the experience of being a man is. I will never know what that is. I know what my experience as a white woman, a very privileged white woman has been like. I can't know, you know, what anybody else's is, but I can listen, I can hear. And, and I know the gift that I can give is, is to listen. You know, it's been a gift today to listen to you, to you really be passionate about, um, about the things that you're seeing and you're feeling just aren't working, you know, in terms of being a man in the world, you know, and listening to you talk about your faith and this sort of thing. And that's been a gift, you know, that's something that I'm grateful for. And maybe, maybe the thing is to be grateful for those conversations, those opportunities that we have to sit with somebody who sees the world differently, um, whether it's left or right, you know, that's a gift to be able to hear somebody else's experience, somebody else's view. Um, yeah, but yeah, gratitude would make a difference. You know, as a faith, a person of faith, we know, you know, we know these things, we know the difference, you know, that it makes to be grateful and, you know, be thankful to, to the source of that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Gratitude is a big thing. I had a guest on, um, Ben Wilby, who's, uh, I call him a personal friend. Okay. Uh, we got to sniping on Facebook and Twitter quite oh, a lot. Oh, yes. And he is, uh, a self confirmed far lefty. Okay. And I kind of tune those people out now because it's, to, uh, they just don't bring anything to, or not only do they not bring anything into the conversation, they're unwilling to engage in a debate or a conversation to go to a better place or at least get the uh, facts straight. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, he was the bigger man on Twitter one time and said to me, you know what, we should probably get together there, mate. He's from, um, uh, England, uh, where was he from? Belfast? No, 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 Belfast is Ireland. He was, yeah. he grew up in England. I can't remember the town. Okay. And then he went to school in Afghanistan at a, a U.S. military high yeah. school there because it was the only one that uh, spoke English and he was relocated by his mother. And he was talking about Thatcher. Okay. And um, Thatcher Milk Snatcher. Now, I don't know if you know the story, but that was her nickname for a long time. When she I didn't was, know that. She was um, in the government before she was prime minister, and she ended the free milk program at schools. Ah. Austerity, he called it. Mm -hmm. And cut, 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 cut. And mm -hmm. he saw how that impacted his family and, and uh, all, the, all the families that were going to school that counted on free milk yeah. every day. You know, yeah. the nutritious, like it was just a thing. And his life experience, like I grew up in the North End of St. Catharines, very mm -hmm. white, mm -hmm. very privileged. I hate that mm -hmm. word now. Um, um, I've always been a tall, white, semi good look. Like, I, you know, I've, mm -hmm. I've got some gifts that I was I didn't ask for. I mean, I'm right. sick for I didn't like, I didn't do anything to get there. It's just how yeah. I turned out. Mm -hmm. And, if that makes me privileged, then great. Uh, you know, I want to use my privilege to my advantage whenever possible. But mm -hmm. he really gave me a context for, oh, geez, you've lived it. Mm. You've actually experienced government cuts and how they affected a whole country. Right. So it's easy for me to sit back and go, oh, yeah, we yeah. don't want your taxes or your socialism because that leads to you know, genocide or whatever. And he really had me go, oh, so there's good reason from where you come from. And, and I didn't know this. And, and again, yeah. you can't even say this without being pigeonholed and boxed in. But Jordan Peterson, in my quest for knowledge, I had two assumptions. I'm not sure that they're true. Mm -hmm. But uh, I created two assumptions in my head. And then I went looking to solve it. Okay. Why were men and women so far apart and at each other's throats so much mm -hmm. recently? And why, same thing for the political left and right. Why the divide? Why is it so deep and far yes. apart? And why are we at each other's throats incessantly, it seems like? And I think, after doing all my research, that the assumption was a little bit of a lie. Because okay. th there's been times where men and women and political left and right have been further apart. We've had civil wars for crying out loud, right? Yeah. 
But this idea that the big five personality type, and this is one of the things, the gift of, of Jordan Peterson's, uh, his university lectures, which I've, I've yeah. seen everything he's done multiple times. Yeah. Because it didn't sink in the first time because he, he uses language in a way that really you have, to, like for a guy like me, mm -hmm. I have to hear it a few times. Right. To really have it sink in and for me to get the meaning of some of the big words that I don't understand. Mm -hmm. But we're actually born this way. We're born conservatives are the conscientious, and I don't mean conscient like they, they have a conscience. I mean, conscientious personality type is orderly, industriousness, and blah, blah. They like their boxes. They like their rules. They like their, um, their faith, you know, and then the um, women suffer for the majority. They don't have this obsessive drive to succeed all the time. They, hey, they want to have families. There's other things are important to them and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And this idea that men and women are the same and equal is just bizarre. Mm -hmm. Like we're not equal. Yeah, should we be treated as equal? Yes, but men are, we do things better. We have proclivities that leave us down different roads. And it helped me to understand that the liberal mindset and the conservative mm -hmm. mindset are birthed into you. Like you okay. grown up in a conservative family and have a lot of blue in your green. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that you're going to stay that way forever. Yeah. This hardwiring in the brain is actually done in the womb. Like you're not mm -hmm. taught how to be a lefty. Mm -hmm. you, you, you actually think that way and you have no control over it. And so That's I don't know where I fit into this because <laughs> I was programmed a lefty and then realized, okay. wait a second, I'm more moderate or center right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't take my guns. Don't tell me yeah. to speech. Don't yeah. tell me we oppress women. And if you tell me how, show me. I'll fight with you. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants yeah. inequality. Yeah. So I just, uh, yeah, that that deep dive into the five, uh, the big five personality type taught me a lot. But this idea that you know, you can change your stripes isn't so easy. I guess. Yeah. Well, that's you know that's interesting. Really interesting perspective. All of that. And you know what I'm thinking? Like as I'm listening listening here it's like you know how i said before about i didn't fit on the left i didn't fit on the right i knew i needed both of those well maybe we need all of that you know we need all of that to make the world work and going back to those conversations that i think we're not having we're not having the conversations about really what we want to create the kind of world we want to have and once we start having those conversations maybe we, maybe the stuff that needs to be cut becomes clearer. Maybe where we need austerity becomes clearer. Where we need to invest becomes clearer. And a lot of those other conversations, maybe they disappear. We realize that we all have a part to play. I don't know. And that's, I'm glad you said that because that's part of what I've learned is that we need, well, men need women. Women mm -hmm. need men. Mm -hmm. We need to be a team, mm -hmm. just like the left needs the right because mm -hmm. the left would have open borders, no ice, no DEA, no immigration, no laws, no jails, no, if they had it their way, it'd just be a free for all. Anytime somebody felt oppressed or offended, we'd move the goalposts for them. Mm -hmm. Whereas on the right, they'd have so many rigid rules that no one would ever become an exception. And we need elements of both right. political ideologies to make it something in the center because, and this is part of my, my growth and my journey into the question of why are men and women, why are the political left and right? Yeah. What I learned, and I think I'm pretty sure this is fact, but as I speak it out, it, it, this is always a test for the truth, mm -hmm. is that 95% of us are right here in the middle. Yeah, yeah. we're on the left, we're on yeah. the right, but yeah. Like, even if you take the, uh, the, uh, the hardest pro-choicer mm -hmm. and you say, okay, uh, nine-month abortion, mm -hmm. cool or no? Oh, no, not cool. Okay, C can we eliminate abortions after six months? Most pro-choicers most pro would say, yeah, oh, yeah, after six months. No, but unless it's a medical necessity, make up your mind before six months. Mm -hmm. And Crowder has taught me this a lot, Stephen Crowder, who is a a Canadian transplant to the States who's a right-leaning conservative, mm -hmm. Christian pro-lifer. And he, this conversation that I never had before. Okay, so when's it life? Duh, for me, life is conception. Like, mm -hmm. don't be stupid. Mm -hmm. um, and 
what I like about Crowder is in his conversation with people that he disagrees with, very often he'll back up to a point where they agree. Ah, yes, yes, yes. And then he'll take small baby steps to yes. see where the fork in the road comes. Yep. And can we, can we, can we, can we delay that fork until further by saying, okay, yeah, I can, I can give you that. Yeah. I didn't know we didn't have a rule, like a law in Canada about abortions. I didn't, mm -hmm. I, I didn't like, I mean, it was just never a concern of mine. Yeah. I didn't know that. You know, the, 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 the race statistics on white cops shooting black kids in the States is not what Black Lives Matter says. We don't live in a race. Yeah, are there racist cops? Yeah, but there's, it's the small yeah. minority. Cops are mostly good. And so the black community has been telling their kids, watch out for the cops or they'll shoot you. Well, what do you, you know, and then we got, uh, this guy just went into a police precinct the other day and unloaded his gun. In mm -hmm. New York City or something, because he's mm -hmm. maybe been told his whole life the cops rode to get him. Mm -hmm. So we need each other, and I think that I, I've forgotten, or I didn't know, or I wasn't aware that most of us are moderately in the middle, and mm -hmm. ninety-five percent of us, and I'm using, I'm just throwing terms around, but the great, the vast majority of us have overlapping beliefs, moral right. convictions, yeah. political aspirations, or convictions, and that the majority in the middle, I call it the moderate middle, are looking to the left and the right extremist and going, you guys are nuts. Because mm. we don't believe you, but they're so loud on the extremes. Mm -hmm. And again, there's so, like when the bell curve goes like this, here's the yep. moderate middle like this. And then as mm -hmm. it goes out down into the end, these guys out here are making all the noise. Right. <laughs> the silent yes. majority is sitting there on their hands going, no, I just want to go to work. I just want to have a good life. I just want to throw on the switch and have my lights come on. I just yeah. want to be healthy and happy. Yeah. And that's all that matters to me. And uh, I think I've, I've lost track about the moderate middle that is just sitting there going, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just but, there's, but you know what? There is so much for humanity <laughs> in general that is common. And I loved what you were saying about backing up to that point, you know, where, where, we, where we do agree, where we can, where we've got this firm foundation. Yes. Yep. We're all here. And that makes, makes the stuff that we disagree on. It makes it a lot, a lot smaller, you know, and we can see more clearly what those granular things are once we're from that base point, you know. People around the world, like I spent two years traveling all over, you know, with my kids. I really wanted to give them a global education. I wanted them to see more than they were seeing, you know, in Fort Erie growing up there. And, oh, you know, all over the world, parents love their kids. You know, people want educations. People are there for other human beings that they don't know. Some of the most meaningful moments for me when I was traveling was when stuff went really, really wrong. And I remember really kind of hoping for my kids that they'd see these things when they happen because you are vulnerable. You are so vulnerable when this happens and you have to rely on complete strangers to help you out. We're down in Mexico. We drove down to Mexico and we're out in this area that we've got no cell phone service, blow a tire, you know, and you know, there's all those stories that we hear. We can go into that. Uh, that can be our context for the experience. But you know what? People stopped. People helped us. It was an ordeal. It took about 20 people over four hours to actually get us back on the road. There were so many points where we could have been taken advantage of. We weren't. People were there for us. That humanity, that connection, that love, that helping strangers, you know, the Good Samaritan, it was there. 20 people in so many different contexts helped us get back on the road. They saw us as human beings. They saw us as their neighbor. You know, they saw us. That's how they saw us. And, you know, yeah, that I is forgot. how so much of the world is. What do we need? An alien invasion for us to get that we're all brothers and sisters and that we need to protect each other? Because you know what? We, we get lost in this, especially on social media with the sniping. You're like, oh, yep. it's a faceless troll account. Yep. I don't care. We forget that there's a human attached to it that actually yes. has the feelings. And you forget yes. that these people have the same wants and needs as you have. 
Yeah. They want to have a good, peaceful life. They want to be loved and connected. Yeah. And the isolation that we feel, and I've been feeling that lately, yeah. but forced isolation is because yeah. that's where the, that's where you, that, the, that is the road to hell, mm-hmm. being alone and isolated and and cut off from your community, whether you right. force it on yes. yourself or not, which yeah. I have kind of lately because, you know, and I have a lie that I've kind of created in my life. I hate people. Mm. It's yes. so stupid because <laughs> I love people, but yeah. everything that I do points to my love for people. Yes. But if I say I hate people, I can get away with not going to anything. Yes. I, I don't have to go to any wedding. I stopped yeah. going to weddings years ago. Yeah. I went to Yoga by Sarah's wedding. That was the oh, yes. I've gone to recently. Oh. Um, for whatever reason, she got married and Walter married her at City Hall, which was a huge step for me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> it, it's just this idea. And, you know, even in real estate, I hate real estate. My mother used to say that it'll be 10 years since my mother died next Amazing. week. Amazing. Yeah. Unbelievable. Way too, way too early. But yeah. she used to say, you know what, Jimmy? You don't hate real estate. Mm-hmm. Yet when you're cashing next and snapping checks, you love real estate. What yeah. you don't like is when you have to dig yourself out of the hole ah. and you're slow and you yeah. got to get down in the dirt and actually work. That's what you Doing like. the work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so maybe, maybe it's the context of doing the work you know, that needs to change. One of the things they talk about in Landmark is, Landmark is the power of changing context, you know? And because within some contexts, you know, only, only certain possibilities can be present. Like if we have a circle here, and this, it's color, and let's say blue and yellow exist in it, all that we've got possible, blue, yellow, and maybe green, you know, so we have to shift the context. And then, you know, other possibilities can be present. So, you know, I heard you talking about, you know, there were parts of your mother's story there about the hard, hard work of it that, that may not be an exciting context that has you want to get out of bed in the morning when it comes to real estate. <laughs> and I could get I that. Did, so, yeah. So maybe you work for me. Just <laughs> Maybe the context needs to change. Who knows? But awesome. we are, we are at 12, 11 here. We have been talking yep. for an over an hour and I think oh. we could talk for days, Jim. Yeah, awesome. Uh, let's book <laughs> part two of it after we go to, uh, to your uh, session 10 for right. communication seminar, is it? This is the forum in action seminar. Forum in action, so, correct. Yep, yep. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. And all I, right. was, I was a guy that you thought that I would be up at the microphone all the time in my landmark farm. Yep. Never spoke once. Really? No, never shared once. Didn't. I did most of the work. Uh, on the way home, I was thinking, what a waste of money. Ah, uh, yeah. And then it started to crash on me. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's one of the most impactful things that I've ever done in my life. And I've gotten away from it and the possibility of leading people to it. So I'm really looking forward to coming uh, with you on the 18th. And I'm grateful right. for riding up with you too, because uh, that helps me a lot. You know, give us a chance to get caught up. So let's book okay. to, uh, part two after that. But I appreciate right. your time. Uh, contact for anybody who wants to get a hold of you later. Uh, for me, yeah. ah, I don't even know what to say here. <laughs> I'll find her on Facebook. Kay Green is my guest. I appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, All right. Jim. We'll talk soon. Bye. Bye. I need to look this thing. Oh, there we go. Kay Green, cool conversation. Uh, an hour 13. So that's good. Uh, thank you, you too. We'll check you later. I will upload this so you can see her face later. And it looks like I didn't shave today. Uh, I got a few surprises coming up for you there, kids. All right, so get with me later. Seven o'clock tonight, I'm gonna make this conversation live on YouTube so that you can see Kay Green's face, okay? I'm not playing any music for you today. I'm just getting out, peace. Um, bye-bye, YouTube. Share, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Oh, there you are. I'm looking at the wrong. I thought I was supposed to be looking over here, but I'm supposed to be looking right here. All right. Kay Green was my guest. Thank you for the time, Kay. And uh, if you go into the Landmark Forum and Action Seminar on the 10th, when you bring your guests, 
I'll be there. So if we have a connection that is Landmark Forum and you're going to be in town that day, in Toronto at the Landmark Education Center on Front Street. Was it Adelaide? Front and Adelaide? I'm pretty sure I will be in town. Let's get hooked up. I got a lot of friends up there. All right, let's end this meeting. Peace out, y'all.